Good morning and welcome to our Lord's Day service for Sunday, May 17th, the sixth Sunday of Easter. Our catechism question this morning is the Westminster Shorter Catechism question number 76, which is the ninth commandment? The ninth commandment is, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And once again, I would encourage you to join us this evening for our Zoom evening service where we will, Lord willing, be unpacking the ninth commandment. With that, let us rise and worship God. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Let us pray. We behold your glory, O God, in the love shown by your Son, lifted up on the cross and exalted on high. Be glorified anew in the love we have for one another as disciples of the risen Lord Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of praise, let us love and sing and wonder. As we come into the presence of Christ, the Lamb of God, who has washed us with his blood, who has indeed brought us near to God, and who will soon, as we sang, bring us home to God. It is fitting and necessary for us to confess our sins, being renewed in grace through his mercy. Let us do that now together through the confession printed in the bulletin, saying, Almighty God, In raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We fail to proclaim the gospel in word and deed. We ignore your call to discipleship. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. 
Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant, given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. up your heads and hear the good news. By obedience to the gospel, you have been purified, washed in Jesus Christ, who is your sanctification. Believe the word of the gospel, the word by which you have been born anew. For in Christ's name, I assure you, your sins are forgiven. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. Please rise for the Gloria Patri. Let us pray for illumination. God of life, your spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Your spirit inspired the prophets and writers of scripture. Send your spirit now to give us light, encouragement, faith, and hope through the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is from the book of Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 8. Hear God's word from Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Sends the reading of the Old Testament lesson. 1 Peter chapter 2 for our New Testament lesson. Verses 2. 22 through chapter 2 and verse 3. Now you have been purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again 
not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. This ends the reading of the New Testament lesson. Let us stand and sing the hymn of preparation, O God of light, your word a lamp unfailing. standing for the gospel lesson, which is taken from Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 35. Hear now the gospel of our Lord. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. We're continuing our series on 1 Peter. Our text is the New Testament lesson from the end of 1 Peter through the beginning of uh, 1 Peter 1, through the beginning of 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter has, to this point, had what we might call a vertical focus. And by that, I mean that which lifts us up to God, to the hope of heaven, to the coming of Christ. Right? We have heard Peter speak of our living hope, of the coming revelation of Christ of a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time, of an imperishable, unfading, undefiled inheritance kept, reserved in 
heaven for us. And he has exhorted us by means of this hope. And the exhortations, we might say, were also vertical in nature. That is, they stressed the God-man relationship. Peter said we're to walk in holiness, for the Lord is holy. He said that as exiles, we should fear God during our time, our stay on earth, because the God we call Father is the judge of all. And this morning in our text, we have a shift to the horizontal, to the relationships we have with one another in the body of Christ. Now, of course, the vertical and the horizontal always belong together. They reinforce and support one another. But in this morning's text, the accent is this way, horizontal. Previously, we've already seen in 1 Peter this pattern of the indicative, the statements about what God has done in Christ, and thus what you are in Christ, what your standing is in, God, in Christ before God, the indicative, and the imperative, the command, how then are we to live in light of Christ's action? So the indicatives, they are about our being. The imperatives are about our doing. It's doing and being, being and doing. A professor at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia used to say, all you need to understand this is a little Sinatra. Doobie, doobie, do. Doobie, doobie, do. Doing, being, doing, being, doing, being. And here, in this text, if you're following along in your Bible, you can see this. The imperative and the indicative, the do's and the be's, they're interwoven beautifully. It goes like this. Chapter 1, verse 22, indicative, followed by an imperative. Verses 23 through 25, indicative. Chapter 2, verse 1, imperative. Chapter 2, verse 2, closing imperative. Chapter 2, verse 3, closing indicative. The indicatives are all about the gospel, all about the gospel, and the imperatives are about our growth in the gospel. And these two things belong like this. They, they're interlocked. So I'm not going to make two formally separate points. We're simply going to alternate between growth and the gospel throughout the text. So again, we're at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. We read, having purified your souls, meaning yourselves, having been purified by obedience to the truth. So a decisive action has taken place in the lives of these Asian, Christians in Asia Minor, I mean, that Peter writes to, and in all Christians' lives, a once-for-all cleansing, having purified yourselves. Or in Paul's language, we were washed. We were sanctified. The book of Hebrews says we were sanctified once and for all time by the offering of Christ. That is extraordinarily good news. We have been washed and sanctified forever. Now remember, Peter opened this book by telling us, you are elect through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So having been cleansed, we enter this state where we seek to be continually cleansed, to be made holy, to be fit, fit for the vision of God. So we are sanctified, we're being sanctified, we shall fully be sanctified. But here's the question that arises. How did this purification occur? Well, it occurs by what the text calls your obedience to the truth. Or what Peter has already called obedience to Christ and sprinkling with his blood. So in short, this decisive, definitive cleansing it occurs by your embrace of the gospel. Obedience to the truth here means faith, faithful reception, faithful trust in the gospel message. Paul preaches the gospel, Romans 1 tells us, the gospel to bring us to the obedience of faith. 
The obedience to the truth is what is Peter's shorthand way of saying embracing the gospel. Jesus says much the same thing in John's gospel when he says, believing him is the work that we must do. This is the gospel. The law says, do this and live. The gospel does not say that. The gospel says, Jesus has done this. You're already cleansed and acquitted. Now live. The law, do this and live. We need to be gospel people. Often Christians revert to the law. The gospel, we got the gospel, that's behind us. Now it's a bunch of do this and live. That's what the law says. The gospel says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It is this obedience to the truth that Peter has in mind. He's not thinking of the fact that they've achieved some level of obedience and that's made them pure. He's saying you have been definitively washed, cleansed, purified, made spotless before God by obedience to the truth, meaning the embrace of the gospel. The gospel is called the word of truth in Colossians, in Ephesians, and in James. To believe the gospel, then, is to obey the word of truth. This is how our souls are washed of their deep stains. This is the abundant free mercy that Peter opened the letter with by saying, according to God's abundant mercy, you have been born again into a living hope through the gospel. So, what then is entailed when one converts to Christ, when one embraces this gospel of free grace? Well, Peter's going to go on and tell us. He says, we have been purified so that so that we might have a sincere love for one another. Or the ESV puts it, we've been purified for sincere brotherly love. So the, the vertical, the washing, the conversion to God is for the horizontal. By its very design, it produces sincere brotherly love. Being born into a heavenly hope creates love among the brothers. And so we move from the indicative, having been purified, to the imperative, love one another deeply from the heart, or love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So I want to spend a couple minutes looking at the nature of the love that we're called to hear, uh, the love which being sprinkled with Christ's blood calls forth First, this love is said to be sincere, a sincere love. This, this word for sincere is always used, always used in the New Testament in association with love. It means unhypocritical, genuine, without pretense. Let love be without hypocrisy, Paul says in Romans 12. And even that, sometimes translated, let love be genuine. So a gospel-purified heart does not merely tolerate the saints or accept them or just keep them just at arm's length. It doesn't even merely like the saints. It seeks sincere love. And the, and the phrase here, love for each other, is translated brotherly love in the ESV, and that's because the word, the Greek word underlying it is Philadelphia, like the city, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia, love for the brothers, love for the brethren, love for the family of God. Now, we are so used to hearing this that I think the fresh, radical edge of it, the newness of this in the world is lost on us. Philadelphia means that the church is a kinship group, right? A family. Simple enough, common enough to us, but it was a completely ridiculous claim in pagan antiquity. Lucian 
who was an ancient Greek writer, said of Christians, and he says this with a sneer, he says, their first lawgiver persuaded them that they are all brothers of one another. I mean, just think of how odd this would sound if you weren't used to calling your fellow believers in Christ brothers and sisters. In the ancient Roman world were people with no physical or racial kinship. Full-grown adults are walking around calling each other's brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters without any of these physical, biological bonds. There's claiming to be some kind of new family which crosses all boundaries and equalizes all distinctions between class and sex, where there's neither male nor female, nor slave nor free, nor Jew nor Greek. A brotherhood without biology and without blood bonds. It's an astonishing thing. So, you know, without in any way despising one's natural family, something new is here, which transcends natural families. Right? It is, a, it is an error to look at the church as a cobbling together of a set of natural families. Well, there's this family, then this family, then this family, then this family. You add all those families together, and you have a church. The church is a new family, which transcends the earthly family, relativizes it. And you can hear something of the startling nature of this in the, in the gospel lesson. Very short gospel lesson from Mark. When Jesus is told, your mother and your brother are outside seeking you. And he says, who are my mother and my brothers? And then he looks at those who are around him and says, here. Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he's my brother and my sister and my mother. It's an astonishing thing to say. And I, I still think for all of its familiarity, it's hard for us to assimilate it. it it's a disorder, beloved, when people will love their earthly family at such great cost, unconditionally, without hesitation, but develop patterns by which the saints are kept at a distance. Right? That love for them is somehow optional. This is a failure to understand the redefinition of family that the word Philadelphia means, that the gospel brings. So the imperative here that follows on this great indicative of being washed by Christ's blood is love one another deeply from the heart. And the word for deeply here means earnestly. That, that, that word there, that earnestly, connotes intensity. Stretched, strained, strenuous, enduring, energetic activity. That's what's in view with this love. Not perfunctory love, not plastic love, not brittle love, not external commandment-keeping love. This is love in the runes, love in the grit of others' lives. It's the, this word for earnest is used of Jesus himself in Gethsemane, where we're told that he was in agony, and then he prayed more earnestly. That's the word Peter uses for love one another earnestly. Of course, the point is not that it's an agonizing chore to love the saints. It's not the, that's not the point, though perhaps at times it can be. The point is that this sort of earnestness is the command. It is the call that flows from embracing Jesus Christ in the gospel. No church, no Christ. You know, another thing to note here, it is often said that love is not a feeling. Love is an action. Well, I want to tell you, this text should dispel that notion because that notion is too simplistic. Right? This earnestness, this intensity, this unhypocritical sincerity involves the whole of our being. Right? Body and soul, intellect and will, passion and emotions. Love is an action. That's true enough. But it is also a set of rightly ordered feelings. Have you ever thought about that? The Bible commands your feelings. It will say things like, weep with those who weep. It will tell you how to feel. 
So love is, is volitional, meaning having to do with your will, but it is also emotional. Love wills, it resolves, but it also weeps and rejoices and feels deeply. It's passionate. And this love is to be from a pure heart, meaning a heart free from ulterior motives, a heart free from manipulation. The heart in the Bible is the whole inner person. The heart thinks and wills. It's the center of your being. So, so Peter is saying something like this. Since you and your heart, your person, your soul, have been purified by the gospel of grace, then love out of a pure heart. We get another, another indicative, another statement of the gospel beginning in verse 23. Since you have been born again. I just want to stop on this rebirth image because it's connected to what we said earlier. The rebirth image means that we are all children now of our Heavenly Father, siblings in a new family, right? Born not of imperishable seed, right? I mean, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed through the gospel. So you are born into this family not by blood, John says in his gospel, not by the will of the flesh, not by some ethnic connection, but by this living creative, life-giving, abiding, enduring, everlasting word of God heard in the gospel, along with the breath of the Spirit, that is what begets us to life. The word heard in the Spirit brings life. Right? That same word, in conjunction with that same hovering Spirit, created the world. That's the word. It recreates us. It resurrects us from the dead. It shines in the darkness of our hearts, showing us the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is beautifully put for us in James' epistle, chapter 1, where he says this, Of his own will, he begot us, he gave birth to us by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Then Peter does this. He cites and this was our Old Testament lesson, he cites Isaiah 40. And what he's doing here is he's contrasting our fleeting existence, our mortality, with the word which lives and abides forever. Peter never tires of this. This is one of the reasons we are exiles. Right? We saw that in Psalm 39. You see it in Psalm 119. You see it in Leviticus. Right? Part of the exile mindset is a recognition that whether we are in Canaan or elsewhere, we are short-lived tent dwellers on the earth. So Peter is, is constantly reminding us that we are fading grass and that our inheritance and our hope are in heaven. And he cites Isaiah and he says, all flesh is like grass. All of its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord abides forever. You know, it's grim to think of human mortality and the fleeting, vaporizing quality of life. So grim that people find a way to go through their whole lives without thinking about it. But there is no despair over our condition here by Peter. And there's no despair because of that last but. But the word of the Lord abides forever. So if we want life, if we want something that's going to endure above and beyond all the changes and chances and flux of historical human existence, something that abides into the eschaton, we have that in the Word. We have that in the Gospel of the risen Christ. This is, Peter says, the good news that was proclaimed or preached to you. So he celebrates the life-giving Word of the Gospel, and then he does what we might expect him to do, he switches back to an imperative. Now, the first imperative that we looked at was, was quite positive. It was about sincere, earnest, brotherly love. This imperative is related, but it's put negatively. It's about the kinds of things we have to get rid of, the kind of things we must lay aside if we're going to show the Philadelphia of the gospel. 
So chapter 2, verse 1 starts with a therefore. Therefore, since you've been born of the living and abiding word, the gospel which was preached to you, then rid yourself of all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander of every kind. He uses this image, this rid yourself image, as the image of changing clothes, putting away your soiled garments, clothing yourself with Jesus Christ. So what has to go for those who live by the gospel? Well, malice, which is a general term for all sorts of evil, deceit and hypocrisy, which are the opposite of the pure, sincere love that he has called us to, Envy, which is a kind of vicious, insidious hatred of the good of others or their prosperity. Often envy is rooted in a spirit of rivalry and competition and comparison. Slander has to go. Slander often flows from envy. Slander is vicious because it lies while pretending to tell the truth. Now, while we could unpack all of these vices... I don't want us to miss the main point. The main point of this list is that all of these vices poison the social life of the church. They poison the social life of the church, its ethos and its spirit. They are corrosive, community-destroying evils. Malice, slander, envy, deceit. We must rid ourselves of all of them. Now, these are often... Um, you know, socially acceptable, tolerated sins. But they must be put aside by anyone who wants to walk in the gospel of brotherly love. And of course, this will be a battle. It turns out that having been washed and having been purified, having been born anew, does not perfect us immediately. There remains a web of deep and twisted and entrenched and subtle evils which must be acknowledged, which must be engaged, which must be put to death and laid aside so that we can begin to reflect Christ. So you are born again, beloved, into a living hope, but also into this great life and death battle with our own broken, rebellious selves. So the gospel, which purifies us once and for all of these things, right, requires that we be cleansed from them daily and progressively over time. So finally here, Peter ends, and this is in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. He ends with an imperative which sort of summarizes all the imperatives. This is beautiful the way he does this. We have an imperative which summarizes all the imperatives, and we have an indicative which is the root or the source of all the indicatives in the passage. So I'll use these last two verses as a sort of conclusion. He says, Like newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk. Now milk is not being contrasted with meat here, like some scripture does. That's not the point. It's being used as an image of wholesome health-giving teaching of what we all need to live. This is the milk of the Word. The same Word which begot you, the Word of God and the Gospel which was preached to you, right? that Word is deposited in Holy Scripture. This is pure milk. Milk uncorrupted by deceit or hypocrisy, right? It's undiluted. No additives. No artificial preservatives. Right? Scripture is organic milk for the soul. And so it's a remedy. Peter looks at it like a medicine to which you must repair daily if you're going to rid yourself of these soul-destroying, community-destroying vices, the vices which are constantly threatening love, Philadelphia. And notice, then, we are to crave this milk. Right? If we are born like a baby, born again, then we will crave this milk the way a baby craves its mother's milk. And so we are to be then addicted, addicted to the word, addicted to the Bible, 
craving the word. Because this is the milk or the nourishment for us, Peter says, to grow up into the salvation which is already ours in Christ. Our present and our future salvation. This is the key to move us from saying, yes, we were cleansed. How do we live out that cleansing? The same word which begot you, nourishes you, and causes you to grow. Did you catch that? The same word which begot you, nourishes you, and causes you to grow. This is important. Please grasp this. The same gospel by which you were converted is the gospel by which you are now standing, in which you stand, in which you walk, by which you grow. We never, 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 never get beyond the gospel. There's no point where we leave the gospel behind and go to the law. We never move into any realm where we are not saved and sanctified and kept by the sheer grace of the gospel of God. We never say, well, that gospel was nice for initial salvation. Now it's all about our obedience. We are saved from the beginning to the end by the gospel alone, by the grace of God at every point. Remember, Christ is not only your justification, Paul tells us, he is your sanctification. You are justified by Christ alone. You are sanctified by the grace of Christ alone. In him, in Christ, now here we get to our last indicative. Peter says, in Christ we have tasted that the Lord is good. There's a beauty to to God revealed in Christ. We are allured by the goodness and kindness of God in the face of Jesus Christ. A lot of people struggle with God in the modern world. Now, there's all sorts of problems. The problem of evil, the problem of loneliness, the pro- this, this issue or that issue. But we need to be directed to the face of God in Jesus Christ, right? to see there that the Lord is good. Flee to Christ, hold the questions for later. Keep asking the questions, but it's in Jesus Christ that we taste the goodness of God. And it is this goodness of God, right? This goodness of God, which is the source of all the other indicatives, all the other gospel indicatives in the text. And it's this goodness which enables our obedience to the imperatives in the text. All the do's and all the be's. All the do, be, do, be, do. They are gospel do's and be's. One is not gospel and the other is not law. They are both gospel. You're being and you're doing. They all flow out of this abundant goodness of God, right? by which you have been saved, by which you are being saved, and by which you shall be saved. So we've said it before, and I will say it again. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Preach it every hour. For all Christian growth, All Christian growing and maturity is growth in and by the gospel of grace. Growth through the pure milk of the living and abiding word of God. Growth in the goodness of God tasted in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us respond to God's word, confessing our faith together in the triune God of grace, whose goodness we have tasted in Jesus Christ. People of God, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. 
And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Let us offer up our prayers and petitions to God who has shown us his abundant mercy in the grace of the gospel. Let us pray. O oh God, your imperishable, living, and enduring word abides forever. While we, in all our glory, wither and die. Empires rise and fall, O God, and you are the eternal king who sits above the circle of the earth. We rejoice that you have washed us, purified us, not by works, but by grace. Indeed, by your abundant goodness, which we have tasted in Christ. Hear, O Lord, the prayers of your people who come in his name. We pray for our land. We pray for our leaders. Grant them to remember that they are your ministers, your deacons, your servants, that they bear your majesty. Make them then doers of your justice. Grant to them your holy, peaceable, heavenly wisdom, turning their hearts to you and to the good of your church. O God, you have poured forth your spirit with your word. Your spirit who is the Lord and giver of life as we have just confessed and who spoke by the prophets. We remember Katie Ann Kalela, Julia Sherritt, and Dabrovka Yuramov. We pray that you would guard and keep these expectant mothers. We pray that you would set apart and consecrate these little ones to your service, these covenant children, even from the womb. For out of the mouth of babes you have ordained praise for yourself, O Lord, to silence the avenger and the foe. We pray for the mission of the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, the people born into a new and indestructible family and called to Philadelphia to sincere and earnest love. We think of the work of Jane Brinkerhoff in Japan. We pray you would strengthen and encourage her and her team in the grace of the gospel And may your word, above all earthly powers, run and be glorified in that land. O Lord, you are the God of all comfort, the Father of mercies. And we pray for those who suffer. We remember Donna Conklin and Coach Spanger and Laverne Holliday. We pray for Shelley Harwood, for Nancy Steinberger, we remember Pat Slagle and William Wilma de Jaeger. We pray, O oh Lord, for Cheryl and her family on the loss of her mother, Lori. We pray that you would bring comfort to them, bring the hope of the gospel, embrace especially her father, Edward, we pray. We pray for Jennifer Quirk's father, Arthur, and for the Quirk family at this difficult time as well, that you would be their helper and their strength. Be near to those that we cannot be near to, O Lord. Look with mercy on all that you have made. Tend to the sick. Shepherd the dying, O Lord. Comfort those who grieve. And rid us of malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander of every kind. That in unity, in deep love from the heart, we might live and we might pray And you would hear us through the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of departure is number 359. Number 359. Having been purified, I charge you to love one another deeply, to lay aside all malice and slander, and to crave the pure milk of the word by which you can grow in the gospel of grace, tasting the goodness of God. Receive now the Lord's benediction as we go. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind in one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.